Yeah, so, so welcome everyone to the Global Research Network's event, Financial Crime and Whistleblowing in the Digital Age. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the Global Research Network. So my name is Yuriko Otomo. I'm director um, of the network and the think tank. It's really exciting. Um, it's, it's been wonderful since we started just over a year ago. And we've come together. It's a sort of member run organization. We've come together to support early career researchers, independent scholars, um, everyone in between, in order to support people in what's often an intensely lonely vocation. Um, and, and difficult vocation because it often involves moving from country to country, from institution to institution, uh, without necessarily this kind of consistent support through um, what's uh, often a very sort of fast changing few years at the, in the early stages of a career. And there are many academics too who, who sort of drop out of the university scene because they've had children or because they become carers and they become independent scholars and we're sort of trying to be there for them as well. So it's a very inclusive organization. Our focus is on equality, diversity, inclusion, uh, and we have members from all over the world. I think at the moment from over 40 different countries and we're hoping by the end of the year to have members from every single country in the world. Uh, and with, we have a particular focus on trying to invite people into conversations uh, from all kinds of different research institutions, particularly in the Global South. So yeah, I'll, I'll hand over, I think, to Demetrius now to talk a little bit more about the Think Tank program itself and uh, perhaps some more of the event uh, and to introduce our wonderful speakers, Nick and Anna, today. All right, over to you. Thank you very much, Eureka. Thank you very much. And thank you to everyone who's participating, especially Anna and Nicholas, for accepting this invitation. So we, uh, myself, Whale, and uh, my other two colleagues, we are leading the International Trade and Corporate Governance Think Tank program, uh, where actually we, uh, we want to observe how, society, how companies are evolving, how uh, international trade is evolving, and what we can do to make these things better. So. Uh, with uh, together with Whale, we were working a paper. We are working a paper about anonymity and whistleblowers, especially in this COVID period where everything is online. And we were inspired to have a discussion about uh, financial crime, new technologies, and whistleblowers. Thinking probably we're correct on that that it's something very topical, very new. And whistleblowers are often victims of what happens. Uh, I think Nicholas and Anna know that. Uh, for instance, the COVID-19 COVID health crisis uh, would have been probably avoided or with less disaster effects if doctors were heard when the time goes back to China instead of silencing them brutally. So we inspired this conversation today from this paper and from COVID and from all what we are uh, living on. So it's really my pleasure to have Anna and Lincoln us with us. So just to give some few lines about the two speakers, um, Anna Yamaoka Enkerlin is an associate at White & Case in New York. She has worked as a legal researcher at Urban Logic as a consultant with the Guarini Global Law and Tech Project at New York University and as a legislative intern to the Canadian Parliamentary Secretary of Global Affairs. Previously, she was also the technology office, uh, in the Technology Office of the International Bar Association, uh, North American Regional Forum, and spent time with IBA Legal Policy and Research Unit Anna holds a degree, a law degree from the University of Oxford and an LLM from New York University. Nicholas, uh, thank you very much, also has over 20 years of experience in higher education and international reputation for excellence in policy-oriented research and financial crime. He has played advisory roles both at nationally in the Home Office Law Commission, but also internationally in NATO, United Nations, Europol. His research has attracted funding from Innovate UK, Economic and Social Research Council, LexisNexis, Risk Solution, the City of London Police for, Force, the Royal United Services Limited, ICT Wilmington Risk and Compliance, and other important funders. Collectively, he has published four monographs, five edited books, and over 50 articles in internationally recognized journals, including Legal Studies, the Cambridge Law Journal, um, studies in conflict and terrorism and contemporary, contemporary issues in law. So we're really, really thankful for being here with us. So uh, we will start with some general questions to our speakers and then we'll go to more, uh, to more specific questions. So I would like to start with Anna, uh, if that's fine for Anna. Anna, thank you. 
So the first question I would like to address you is that, I mean, depend, based on your research and on your work, did you, did you notice an, a rise in financial crime during COVID? And if, if you did, how do you explain that? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen a lot of uh, organizations call COVID the perfect storm for financial crime. Um, you know, we have a situation of an economic dirt downturn, you know, an increase of financial instability um, of people, uh, organizations uh, and individuals feeling like they're in an increasingly vulnerable situation. And that for some people can increase the pressure uh, and the temptation to engage uh, in some of that type of behavior. And then I think, uh, so the pressure sort of to engage uh, in, in financial crime was then coupled with an increase in the opportunity to do so. Um, so, you know, we saw governments rapidly um, rolling out much needed, um, but often fast, you know, fast tracked uh, procurement programs um, and funding programs for businesses and individuals, but often without, um, and again, that could, you know, for good reason, but often without sort of the checks that would have uh, normally been in place. And I think that now looking back um, as we start to audit some of those um, programs, um, we're going to see more and more evidence um, of some of the abuse and potentially uh, corruption uh, that was taking place there. Work from home and uh, increased um, online dependency. Um, and also I think the uncertainty that individuals were feeling is something that a lot of online criminals took advantage of. So we saw a huge increase in um, online scams and phishing in particular uh, scammers updating some of their schemes to be posing as uh, you know, official information sources to, to get information uh, from people, encouraging people to you know, click here for health information um, when actually uh, there was data ha harvesting malware um, being put on their systems. Um, you know, you had uh, the UK cybersecurity agency uh, reported three times um, or more scams um, in the last, uh, you know, few months than there had been in the previous three years combined. And then, you know, that online dependency and vulnerability was not just on the individual level, but we saw that for organizations as well. So uh, local governments have been a target. And we know that, uh, you know, governments are critical in that they're overseeing water utilities, airports, schools, uh, healthcare facilities. They often lack the funding, uh, however, to be able to protect themselves against cyber criminals and then to actually be able to um, investigate individual cases. Um, we also saw cyber criminals targeting a lot more critical infrastructure. Recently in the U.S., there's been a wave of attacks against hospitals. And, uh, you know, in Germany in October, there was a reported case where a woman had a heart attack and she couldn't, they called, you know, the ambulance took her to a hospital and was actually diverted to another hospital because all of the systems in that hospital had been um, shut down by ransomware. And the uh, German uh, prosecutors actually started investigating that case as a homicide. And they're talking about it as a, you know, death the first, you know, case of death caused by ransomware, um, and in the end, they weren't able. They weren't. They didn't pursue it um, as such because they encountered issues with legal causation. But I think that really illustrated um, very clearly the kinds of um, risks that we've seen um, with the rise in um, in financial crime uh, and other crime during COVID. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. Indeed, yeah. So, Nicolas, can I ask you the same question? What is your opinion? Did we have more financial crimes during COVID, and how do you? What is your point of view? How do you explain that? Um, I, th I think Anna's raised some really important points, and, and I, I'd agree with with all of them. Uh, I, I think what we've seen within the UK is um, obviously with with the the furlough scheme provided by the government, uh, and how important that's been for 12, 15 months. Um, so what we have seen are uh, reports from various sort of independent think tanks, like the National Audit Office, which they would suggest that the amount of, of tax fraud, furlough fraud, is now topping 55, 56 billion pounds. So I'm assuming you know, 50, 60 plus billion dollars in, in terms of the, if, if my maths is as bad as it normally is. Um, so what we have seen is a significant increase of tax fraud. Um, and the, the the current government have now created, again, you'll, you'll pardon my, my, my cynicism here, but they've created another task force to investigate that particular issue. And it'll be intriguing to see how that HM Revenue and Customs Task Force investigates and maybe even prosecutes um, with a contrast where the, the, the model adopted by the, the, the Department of Justice in America is where they do have specific fraud task forces. The results in America are significantly better in terms of asset recovery, convictions, um, forfeiture, disgorgement orders. So it'll be intriguing to see eventually when 
figures are released later this year, maybe early into next year, you know, what has been the performance of, of HM revenue and customs. Um, I, I think cybercrime it clearly is, has been a significant increase. I mean, I, I like everybody listening, maybe has had a text appearing to be from a government department, please asking, you know, dear Nick, can you please reclaim your £40 tax benefit for COVID? And it's just a classic phishing text that it's as if the the cyber criminal has simply changed from your normal, please click on this link to get your bank account details to more of a, of a COVID-related theme. Um, and of course, it just emphasises within the UK that fraud is the most frequently committed crime. Um, according to the Office of National Statistics, reports they publish every year, about a, about a third of all crime in the UK now is fraud related. And we are seeing a significant increase of targeting people online. I think, as, as, as um, Anna mentioned, whether people are now more vulnerable, isolated because of lockdowns, and people are happy to communicate with people, whether it's by text messages, social media platforms, or gaming platforms, Xbox and PlayStation, for example they are more vulnerable to being groomed, not necessarily in, in a, a sexual way, but in terms of maybe sort of being groomed by an organised criminal gang to maybe launder money or to act as a money mule for them. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of scary. And, and I think, as Anna said, it is that perfect storm where, you know, law enforcement uh, may be more directed towards implemented COVID protection rooms, uh, rules, they might then be diverted away from more, more of the financial crime and sort of cyber crime related investigations. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicola. That's very interesting. I think we all receive this kind of e phishing emails or calls wherever we are in, in, in this world. So my next question coming back to Anna is that, so do you think that uh, technology plays a significant role, contributes to the rise in digital fraud, or it may be also COVID crisis? It's a combination of the two. So uh, what is your opinion about that? Yeah, I think we're definitely seeing technology contributing to financial crime. Uh, you know, we've already mentioned ransomware, malware, and, you know, those kinds of related schemes. I think something that I'm particularly interested in is this nexus between financial crime, technology, and disinformation. And I think we see that the technology that's required to enable the kind of deception that can lead to things like fraud and market manipulation, you know, there's a whole range. So you have garden variety misinformation that nowadays, because of the tendencies of algorithms to spread that kind of information faster and further um, than ever before, the ability to uh, create bots that can also help to spread that information um, even further. Um, so you have that sort of garden variety uh, technology enabled misinformation. Um, then you have the rise of cheap fakes. So I think a lot of people hear about deep fakes, but cheap fakes sort of refers to the creation of content without necessarily using um, complicated uh, type technology. So an example that had come up in the US election uh, was a widely shared video of Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. And the video had been just so subtly slowed down, which is something that you know most anyone could figure out how to do on their computer. So it looked like she was slurring her speech. Um, now, this, these types of cheap fakes also exist in that gray area where platforms often feel very uncomfortable about taking down that kind of information because it sort of exists in this area between, you know, is it, is it really fake? Is it false? Um, but, you know, you can imagine a video being put out of President Biden or of the head of a financial organization of a CEO that makes it look like, you know, they're having health difficulties, um, for instance, um, and that leading to, um, you know, a, a sudden sort of spike in the market that someone could take advantage of. Um, you know, there was in 2013, there was a Syrian terrorist group that took advantage of that. And what they did was they hacked um, Associated Press, which is a you know, reputable news organization in the US, and they hacked their Twitter feed and put out a tweet that looked like it came from them just saying, you know, two explosions in the White House, the president has been hit or something like that. And, you know, the market saw that and there was a flash crash which, um, you know, the Dow dropped 150 points. It recovered a few minutes later, but you can see how, um, you know, using those kinds of tactics, there's a possibility, you know, a huge um, opportunity there to be committing financial crime. Um, and then, you know, looking to the future, you start thinking more about deep fakes. Um, I think a lot of people will think about videos that can be used to, um, you know, implicate people, bribe people, um, you know, encourage corruption. But there's a voice element as well that I think we're seeing more and more. So um, the technology is getting better. So you require less data to train these kinds of algorithms. And already we've been seeing attempts to mimic the voices of CEOs, for example, um, using algorithms that have been trained on publicly available information, you know, earnings calls, uh, TED Talks, et cetera. 
Um, and you can see, um, you know, we've seen how the market has, uh, you know, in cryptocurrency and other areas reacted to messages that have come from Elon Musk, for example, and we'd be pretty straightforward to mimic, uh, to mimic that and achieve uh, and achieve the same result. Um, so yeah, I mean, those are just uh, a few examples. Um, we can go in, you know, everything to do with cryptocurrency, for example, that possibilities um, are rife um, in that area, um, algorithmic trading, um, you know, tacit collusion with uh, in the area of antitrust uh, and algorithms and on, um, you know, virtual cartels. So there's uh, yeah, no shortage of things to, to be tackling going forward. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, I mean, that's amazing how how great variety they have and what they can do with such a little thing. So Nicolas may ask you the same question. So give us your point of view about digital fraud. Uh, I mean, technology, financial crime, and probably the COVID or other reasons behind that. Uh, I, th I think the association between financial crime and technology is it, it's uh, it, it is kind of scary. Uh, I'm not a technology expert. I, I can I can use my cell phone, and that's pretty much about it, really, and, and a laptop to access things. But I think what what we have seen is that the the link between financial crime and technology is, is not particularly new. Um, it's very well documented that the the Al Qaeda terrorists 9/11 docu uh, communicated by text messages and email messages. So there is a long tradition, um, the last two decades of, of criminals using new forms of technology. I think what what my research has sort of um, looked at is the link between the the evolution of the money e wallet providers and, and terrorism and financing in particular. Um, so what we have seen in the last four years, primarily in convictions in America, have been sort of individuals who have maybe committed a low-level fraud. Um, Zubia Shanas is one recent example, um, where according to the US Department of Justice, she stole $26,000 from her bank and then attempted to convert it into cryptocurrencies and then to send that to ISIS sympathizers in, in, the, in the region of the Middle East and Asia Pacific Rim. And obviously that can then be linked into the dark web, the high levels of anonymity provided. We've seen Silk Road 1 in, in the US, Silk Road 2 in the UK. So I think if anything, it, it's, and I think as Anna correctly mentioned, you just have a look at one person endorsing a particular cryptocurrency, the impact that can have on, on, on the, the, infl the, the inflation of cryptocurrencies, for example. And I suppose that the, the difficulty with cryptocurrencies is that because of the, I think that the financial sector, that the regulations are trying to catch up with this new form of technology and they're not quite there yet. So it's one of the questions has been, how do we regulate uh, forms of e-money globally? Um, so you've got the Financial Action Task Force, extension of the recommendations, the Fifth Money Laundering Directive, but ultimately it's still a very convenient method. And, and we published a paper last December, which sort of identified a new social network in terrorism financing typology, where you've got, you know, terrorists using um, low level fraud to gain access to money, but are then using cryptocurrencies and social media platforms to either exchange the, the, the money. And what is very important and has probably been affected by COVID is how law enforcement agencies work together with the exchange of information, which is becoming, I think, more and more important. So, so what we have seen for a number of years is the exchange of information from the private sector to the public sector. So your if your bank has a suspicious activity report, you know, Nick Ryder's deposited a million pounds in cash in his bank, that's a bit suspicious, Nick, we report him. But what's now important is the exchange of information between the private sector and the private sector. And this is what the Dutch have been really aggressive on in the last 18 months is allowing its largest financial institutions to actually exchange information privately. Obviously, there are privacy concerns, um, but it does appear that that is the next evolution in terms of attempting to tackle financial crime. But whether that can work within the cryptocurrency, that the online technology is, is, is yet to be determined. So I think we see more and more fintech, regtech companies working with law enforcement agencies against really emphasizing the importance of that private public partnership between uh, those institutions. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Yeah, I mean, cryptocurrency is the new thing, so we have many things to learn. So I would go back to Anna, and I will ask that, I mean, you, you both said, you know, we have financial crime, digital financial crime, but uh, is there anything we can do to tackle that? Is there anything we can do, you know, to, to stop that or to diminish the effects? 
Yeah, so I mean, I think two of the main challenges with tackling digital financial crime are the challenges with detection uh, and then the challenges with uh, with attribution. There's a lot of work that's happening at the technical level, uh, you know, using things like digital forensics uh, on, on both of those things. Um, but I think a lot of it also, you know, even if that's in place um, and it very much is a race um, between the, you know, the criminals and those developing the technology uh, to stop them. Um, so as, as Nick mentioned, there's, uh, you know, things being online, uh, virtual space, there's a really important element of cooperation that has to happen here, both between public and private, um, but also, you know, across legal jurisdictions, because that's been another challenge with stopping, uh, you know, digital financial crime, is that even if, you know, you have overcome the technical barriers, and you've managed to, uh, you know, detect a crime, you've managed it, to attribute it to a source, you've managed to track down that entity or person, uh, they may be in, in a jurisdiction where, you know, law enforcement from a particular country can't reach, um, and, you know, the law Laws can't reach either. So there's, you know, a really big need for uh, international cooperation in that space. And then, you know, with very much um, on theme with this talk, I think whistleblowers um, have, have played and will continue to play um, a big role in um, stopping digital financial crime. Um, and something that I think is heartening is the rise of technology that we've seen to um, empower and assist whistleblowers. So, you know, 50 years ago, it took uh, Daniel Ellsberg, you know, 18 months meticulously copying page by page the Pentagon Papers. Nowadays, you know, the or uh, yeah, the Pentagon Papers, but nowadays, uh, you know, the Panama Papers, um, rather, it was, you know, a couple clicks and it was 2.5 you know, terabytes uh, of information. Uh, so with that, we've seen uh, the rise of technology, like things like SecureDrop that allows people to drop those kinds of files. Um, we've seen, uh, you know, hotlines and web portals have been available for a while now. Um, but some platforms are also taking advantage um, of things like um, blockchain um, and, um, you know, along and, you know, with text messages and emails and um, really trying to capitalize on, on the raft of avenues to encourage whistleblowers to come forward. Um, some of those technology platform providers then are also integrating all of these um, and being able to inc um, integrate companies um, and government's case management systems um, also is allowing them to take advantage of some of the cross benefits of this sort of technology. Um, and then we're also seeing the rise of very specialized whistleblowing technology platforms, you know, ones that are specifically aimed at healthcare workers or specifically aimed um, at journalists or security traders. So that's also really positive as well. I think the last, uh, you know, possible avenue for tackling digital financial crime, which is related, is the role of uh, white hat hackers. So I think another thing that we've seen um, with whistleblowing and technology is this aligning of the concepts of hackers, leakers, and whistleblowers. Um, and the role that many white hat hackers play is that they will, sometimes they'll, you know, they'll be hired and there's a rising um, sort of hacker for hire um, and bug bounty type industry uh, that has come up where you actually specifically ask someone, you know, can you try and penetrate our systems? Um, and see and report on and report on those kinds of vulnerabilities. But there are also um, researchers and hobbyists um, who will also do this um, unsolicited um, and then often report uh, to companies um, or sometimes will report those kinds of vulnerabilities publicly. Um, where we're seeing issues is when companies do not welcome um, that kind of testing and they might try and retaliate, they might try and suppress um, either because they don't want to, you know, undertake the remedial expense of fixing this, or they want to suppress reports um, of past, for example, customer information leaks. And these white hat hackers then are being prosecuted under outdated laws like the Computer Fraud Abuse Act uh, in the U.S. And it's really disincentivizing that type of information to the point where many people are saying, uh, you know, security researchers are saying this kind of work just isn't worth it anymore. And that's a really big problem, right? Because I think that that's one of the main, uh, you know, if we're going to fight fire with fire, I think that's one of the main sides that on, on this side of the arms race um, we have. So that's an area where I think if the law changed, um, it'd be a really big benefit in terms of fighting financial crime. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important. And we'll see that in more details in a while. So, Nicolas, can you also give us your experience? Maybe the UK also experienced that would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, 
it's really tough to follow Anna's, Anna's answers because they're so comprehensive. And, and really, I think one of the um, the key things within within the UK, uh, just to pick up on one of Anna's points, mutual legal assistance is of paramount importance. I mean, you look at the money laundering conventions and, and uh, the forms of cooperation between nation states, it, it is paramount importance that countries work together to try to tackle uh, financial crime. I think within the UK, um, I think the... Um, UK government are still basking in the glory of the 2018 mutual evaluation report by the Financial Action Task Force in terms of the UK having one of the highest rated um, sort of anti-money laundering, terrorism, financing, legal frameworks. Uh, I and others would question that for a variety of reasons I won't bore you or, or the listeners with now. Um, but I think in, in terms of um, effective efforts, I think that obviously the legal framework has to be robust, um, but it has to be enforced. And I think that probably is is a, a very important part of the UK's financial crime strategy. Will be it's it's a rather inconsistent policy towards enforcement. Um, so I, I think there has to be an appetite for enforcement, and it's it's difficult to say with the current UK government. So one of the key areas of reform currently is the the liability for companies for financial crime legislation. And we've had a very old doctrine in the UK called the identification doctrine. So if you want to prosecute a corporation, you have to identify which one person within a multinational bank had the direct and will in mind of the company. So as you can imagine, if you've got a large multinational financial institution with offices in 20 countries, where do you prosecute? Do you go for the Hong Kong branch, Singapore, America, Mexico, wherever it might be? So it really is a, a legal minefield. And that's been looked at currently by the Law Commission. So that's a really important development. But it, it does come down to also adequate resourcing. Uh, one of the things we have found with the impact of, of, the, uh, of the pandemic and, and largely since the 2007 financial crisis and austerity measures in the UK is that law enforcement agencies have sadly had budgets cut. So they don't have the necessary um, qualified investigators to maybe look at the the cybercrime level, to look at the the threat posed by rogue nation states, the the threat presented by maybe hacktivists as well. Um, so I think that all of those issues, despite having a very good legal framework, a lot of it does come come down to the will of government, but also it's their infrastructure, and that the what you tend to find is that the the cyber criminal will be at least several steps ahead of the law enforcement agency in terms of technology and financing. So unless that money is, is adequately provided, where, you know, I think the, the UK's National Crime Agency wanted to increase their budget by 300% just to try and tackle the increase of cyber crime and, and human trafficking, that money's not been forthcoming from the government because of COVID. So I think that it, it is that, you know, it is that vicious circle that needs a a joined up, clear, coordinated effort amongst law enforcement agencies and also the government as well. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Yeah, I think cooperation is very important and very difficult at the same time. So I will continue with Anna now for the specific questions. And um, I, 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 I mean, if you want, I can address you the questions and then you can have 10 minutes to answer them. So the first one, I mean, you talked about whistleblowers, you know that. So anonymity and financial rewards, I mean, how we will incite whistleblowers to come forward? How effectively can we protect them? So I, I, what do you think? Are they really controversial or not? Should they be there or not? And the next question is, if whistleblowers during this COVID crisis were, if, were protected, I mean, depending on your experience and what you, you know. And the final one I always wanted to uh, ask you because you have written about is if technology will replace whistleblowers. I think that's very interesting. So I can also tell the questions again, or you can take 10 minutes to answer them. Sure. Why don't we go through them one by one, just so I also don't lose track? So, uh, sorry. So the first one is about anonymity and financial rewards, because they are so debated. So what is your, your, your opinion? Yeah, thank you. So you're right. They're two very controversial, you know, topics. Um, on the, you know, on the part on anonymity, I think, especially... Um, you know, in the society that we live in, we're often whistleblowing, uh, despite the public service that a lot of these people provide, um, is so highly stigmatized, where they suffer from so much um, retaliation. We can't, our response cannot be to turn away from anonymous reports. I think the most important thing is that any whistleblower, anonymous or not, should be judged on the credibility and veracity of the information, um, wherever it is coming from. Of course, 
um, you know, one of the downsides when you do have an anonymous reporter is that it can make investigation uh, more difficult. And I think that that's a place where, um, you know, there's some interesting technological developments happening um, in terms of creating spaces where whistleblowers can maintain their an uh, anonymity, but communication can, can continue to happen, hopefully to a point where trust is created so that that person feels like they, you know, that they're comfortable enough to step forward. Um, another interesting example uh, that's being applied uh, in sexual assault cases on college campuses, but I think could be applied um, in many other areas, are these uh, this idea of a data escrow. So the idea is that sometimes people don't want, they don't feel comfortable um, reporting themselves unless they have, they can come forward um, non-anonymously with at least one other person. So they can make their report and that report will be held in a data escrow. And then if someone else were to report, for example, on the same person, that would be, it would be at that point that someone would be given the choice to then forward, for example, both complaints um, on to the relevant um, you know, agency or administrator to, to deal with that. Um, of course, you know, there are risks with anonymous reporting um, and there, you know, the law does provide remedies um, when these things are done in bad faith um, and maliciously. There are now options um, to go to court to have intermediaries. This has happened in, um, you know, abuse cases with Twitter to give up um, some of the identities of, of people who are posting. Of course, risks on the other side as well um, in terms of companies trying to ferret out um, whistleblowers that are trying to expose them. Um, so challenges there, but I don't think that's um, a reason to be uh, you know, discounting anonymous whistleblowing um, in total going forward. In terms of financial rewards, this is possibly even more controversial. Uh, so financial awards, very popular in the US um, as well as in South Korea, typically not, uh, not really uh, a part, a big part of whistleblowing schemes elsewhere. Um, there's a lot of literature on this, but some, some of the arguments against it is that there's a thought that um, it could encourage, um, you know, the like malicious abuse, but that, you know, we haven't really seen that. And, you know, awards are being paid out after, uh, after these things are actually investigated um, and the information is verified. Um, there's also this general idea that it's, you know, it's unethical, it's taking away from, you know, someone morally doing the right thing. But I, I really don't agree with that. You know, I think we we know that whistleblowers suffer. Um, we know that even when they do get legal redress, that doesn't cover the scope of harm that they experience in terms of ostracization, uh, stigmatization, um, blacklisting. So I think that to the extent that financial reward can make someone a little bit more um, whole um, after they've brought this to light, um, I don't think that's a reason. I don't think that's something that counts against it. We also know that it works. Uh, you know, the SEC in the U.S. does really does um, receive a huge number of um, reports and tips. Um, and without this kind of cushion, we don't know whether these whistleblowers would have come forward otherwise. And then I think the third point in favor of financial rewards is that it creates a system where lawyers can become crime fighters. And we're seeing lawyers now who have, um, you know, the financial incentive and support who want to fight corruption, who are actively seeking out cases and seeking out people who want to, who want to bring forward these cases. They're vetting the information themselves. They're assisting with these investigations. They're bringing that information um, to the authorities. And then, you know, and then they're compensated for, for doing so. And, and, you know, and I think that, uh, that, that that's a good thing as well. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. I mean, I will just change a bit the, the order because I'm really tempted to listen to Nick coming from Europe. Yeah, that think... would be great. I think okay. that'd be great. <laughs> it's just a bit of creativity. I know if, if Nick, you won't intervene because I think we have a different con perception of financial rewards and anonymity. And I just wanted to know uh, what is your approach? Because I think Europe is a bit more reluctant to uh, bring that in light in here. Yeah, I think from you know what I've I've not sort of published anything extensively on whistleblowing, um, but yeah, I do think there is a reluctance within Europe and within the UK to to uh, to encourage whistleblowing, and and, and um, you know I I don't think any any model of whistleblowing is perfect. It's fundamental that whistleblowers are protected, um, and I agree with Anna that you know there are some scholars who argue that the the SEC is an incentivized system and there are immoral argues behind that. But actually, I think that it's been sort of a real eye opener for me to read a lot of these really interesting cases where, you know, em employees have done the right thing and have subsequently 
blown the whistle and you know made allegations about regarding corporate misconduct and, and, and corporate fraud and and if we take a look back at the 2007 eight financial crisis and the, the massive fines imposed in in across the world in terms of you know the, the LIBOR scandal the forex scandal market manipulation that's what we, we so what we've seen are these these financial penalties imposed but it makes you wonder you know were there whistleblowers? Because we, we're not really aware, aware of that in the UK because um, the significant fines on, um, I don't want to use the term rogues gallery, but you know, it's, the, it's the usual suspects of financial institutions with the financial crisis. Uh, so to me, the, there needs to be a, a careful reconsideration, I think, of the culture, uh, this side of the pond in relation to the, the limited protection offered for, for whistleblowers. Um, you're always going to have a counter argument that it might be incentivized. And, and, you know, some people might be seen to be career whistleblowers. I'm not saying there are, but I think it's of paramount importance that, you know, we we offer whistleblowers the financial protection, but also in terms of their well-being as well. I mean, you, know, you see a lot of well-documented examples of where whistleblowers have been targeted by the, I mean, you know, we, we've seen this in the UK recently where, um, one of the biggest fines imposed for breaching the SM and CR rule, which is the senior management certificate regime in the UK, was imposed on, on one of the CEOs of the UK's banks for how they handled a whistleblowing complaint, a fine of £640,000. Um, so, it, yeah, it's it's not where I think we'd like to be. And I think America does offer us some some interesting points for comparison between the two. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick. Thank you. Very interesting. Uh, so, Anna, um, do you believe whistleblowers were effectively protected during the COVID-19 crisis? Well, I think um, COVID forced us to confront this, um, you know, on a daily basis almost, right from the very beginning with reports coming forward. Um, we saw some, in some countries early examples when people would raise the, you know, would blow the whistle, they would, they would disappear. Um, and, but, you know, even for example, in the UK, um, Protect, uh, which is an organization that protects um, whistleblowers, we recently reported that between September uh, 2020 and March 2021, as many as one in four people who came forward uh, to them saying that they had raised COVID-19 related concerns with their employers had actually lost their job. Um, in the US, the National Employment Law Project, um, they found that more than half of uh, retaliation complaints that had been received were being um, dismissed um, by the relevant regulatory body in the US, um, that only 2% of them were being investigated and resolved. Um, they also conducted a national survey, which found that black workers were more than twice as likely as white workers to be released um, after raising complaints. And they were also uh, less likely to have the issues that they had raised um, actually be resolved. I think in line with kind of that perfect storm that we mentioned earlier, um, you know, on, on the agency side of things, they were, of course, themselves experiencing a lot of disruption, whether that was funding being pulled because it was being put to other areas of the government, because whether it was because of uh, being short staffed, illnesses, um, you know, entire agencies working from home um, when that had never happened before. Uh, you know, promised increases in enforcement and investigations uh, in terms of staff that being put on hold, again, because of funding being diverted. And so, um, yeah, you know, I think whistle, were whistleblowers protected effectively or enough during COVID? I think the answer is no. But if there's one thing that comes out of it, I think it's really shone, you know, it's, it's shone the spotlight on how, you know, whistleblowing can, can have extreme consequences, including, you know, life and death ones. And that I think around the world has been a call to be, to, you know, to look again um, at the law uh, and at the enforcement um, level and see, um, you know, what changes we can make to support whistleblowers. Yeah, fortunately, yeah, you're right. Uh, and just my last question to Anna for the moment, from going to Nick, is can technology replace ways to blow us? Can we talk about robot ways to blow us or algorithmic, which is, yeah, I mean, I find it very interesting. Yeah, of course. Uh, you know, there's certainly really exciting opportunities in this area. The use of technology to, uh, you know, to analyze huge amounts of data to spot patterns and make predictions is, is nothing new. But we have an unprecedented availability of data, and some of that has come from uh, people from, you know, the open data mo movement, um, pushing for more disclosure and more transparency. 
Um, but often I think when, when we talk about the push for transparency and the release of data, that that's kind of where the conversation stops, but releasing all this information isn't the same as transparency. And a lot of times we actually can use um, this sort of technology to be able to bring us insights that wouldn't otherwise come to light um, without the use of things like artificial intelligence to help to spot patterns. So I think that when the conversation about technology replacing whistleblowers, um, it's about being the way that um, governments, that companies, that banks are using reg tech um, and sub tech when it comes to you know KYC and AML compliance, um, when it comes to um, detecting corruption in procurement, for example, the, the ability to digest vast amounts of data from very different sources, I think is really exciting as well. Um, you know, if you can pull not only public documents, but also, um, you know, newspaper reports and also uh, indications that you might be getting from social media. Again, those are things that can bring things to light that might otherwise have never, um, you know, no one might have ever spotted. Or um, if they did come to light, we would have had to rely on a whistleblower to do so. So this is one area when, when we talk about technology replacing people, I think that there's a lot more upside. You know, algorithms can't be retaliated against. Um, they can't be they can't be blacklisted from their work from their workplaces, and so that is uh, you know a, a really exciting avenue to go to go down. Of course, with all these things. Um, there are privacy concerns, uh, you know, on the on the top end now there's talk about, um, you know, but what if, um, you know, a system can say, you know, based on X number of characteristics, um, based on where this person is placed at work, based on the communications that we can see that they've had, um, or the people that they're in contact with, we think that they are more, you know, they're more likely to commit a crime. And what do you do with that? with that kind of information? How do we make sure that, um, you know, there've been some testing that's been done on some fraud detection systems that have been found to be biased um, and more likely to flag minorities, more likely to flag even men as a, as a category. Um, but there's, you know, work being done um, on anti-bias uh, training for algorithms, on creating explainable AI, et cetera. So, uh, you know, we aren't gonna see, I think a, a full on replacement and there will be a human uh, you know, there will be a need, of course, to, to keep human whistleblowers, but it's a really exciting um, uh, area, I think. And, and I would like to see, I would like to see whistleblowers replaced with technology um, more often. Thank you, Anna. I think indeed it's very interesting. So we, are, we have many things to see in the future. So now we'll go back to Nick and ask him, how can the technology, uh, the current technology play a role in curbing financial crime? Um, what is your opinion about that, Nick? Um, I, th I think it, it's really important uh, that the law enforcement agencies, government departments, um, really embrace the the, the positive um, nature of, of, I think as Anna's mentioned to and answering your questions earlier, how how new forms of technology can contribute towards tackling financial crime. And, and we're involved at, uh, with, with a current research project, um, which is funded by the British government that uses um, sort of academic typologies of money laundering, terrorism, financing and fraud, and how that can feed into the use of open source data, open source intelligence. And just to give you an example, um, one of the, uh, the terrorist attacks in London Borough Market in the UK in 2017, the, uh, it took the police uh, investigation 12 hours to identify what credit card pay, paid for the, the rental vehicle that the, the terrorists used, which is unprecedented in terms of the exchange of information. Um, that model is called the Joint Money Laundering Intelligence Task Force, or GIMLET, um, which is regarded as best international practice. But there are tech companies that can actually do that investigation within six minutes. So in terms of what the technology can do in terms of looking for algorithms and open source data, liaising with for the financial services institutions, to me, it's, it can provide um, police investigations with, with a more holistic understanding of a money launderer, human trafficker, a sex offender, a terrorism financier, a fraudster. And then conversely, as Anna said, it can also be used to protect whistleblowers whether it speeds up the process, whether it becomes automated, whether it offers more protection um, and protects the anonymity of the whistleblower. So I think for me that, you know, it, it, is, a, um, it is about time, I think, that we did fight back a little bit more uh, and use new forms of technology to really enhance the financial intelligence. But also, I think it's not, you know, I suppose the old adage has been, oh, let's follow the money. 
you know, whether it go through about Al Capone or Nixon in terms of that, and in terms of organized criminal gangs, the mafia, and so on. Well, if you follow the money and you follow the data, you're going to end up with an even better understanding uh, of from a law in terms of investigation. And it's not as if the data sources aren't there. The data sources are there. It's a question of having a proportionate investigatory powers tool that protects people's privacy, but also gives law enforcement agencies the mechanisms to make a real difference because the, the criminal has always been, you know, four or five, six steps ahead. I remember speaking to someone from the FBI a couple of years back who said, if we're only three steps behind, that's a good day at the office. So you can see that new forms of technology, I think, can really provide not a level playing field, but it can close the gap a little bit, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, indeed, actually. So that comes, uh, I mean, what you said, my next question is what more, I mean, the current regulatory framework, I think it's not really, um, how say, competent to solve this problem. So what can we do? I mean, you talked pre previously about cooperation cross board. So can we talk, do we have something to propose, you know, or something that can be done? Um. I think that what 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 we in terms of the new technology, uh, I think what what we what we're looking for, I think, is more of the it's more of a joined up approach. Um, you know, we can have legal framework can offer UX, Y, and Z. Um, law enforcement can cover in terms of financial penalties, prosecutions, investigations. But what we do need is is a more of a clear strategy. Um, from the private sector to the public sector. That, to me, is of paramount importance. I think if you look at any form of, of financial crime, whether that be through fraud, money laundering, market manipulation, there is a clear link between the private sector and the public sector. So to me, that that relationship has to be a central part of that that policy towards trying to tackle financial crime and you know whether that links into whistleblowers by linking in with a, with a particular safe mechanism to, to make their allegations whether that be through a uh, mobile phone or, or a secure secure network but for me it's about and then again it's about private to private exchange of information one of the major problems of tackling financial crime is the poor quality of financial intelligence and i can sit here and spout off many examples of how money laundering the definition of suspicion well you know you might have an interpretation as might i and, and it could come down to well you know nick's got into his bank and it's the way he leans up against the wall when he's in the queue you know i've heard examples of where that's been reported by a, a bank teller and, and there's no suspicion it just depends on yeah that, that person looks a little bit dodgy well so it, to me it's about improving that that level of financial intelligence and, and what the private to private exchange information can provide is a more detailed holistic understanding and with the exchange of information model, you know, that need, so that would include, for example, your financial institutions, your law enforcement bodies, your maybe your MI5 and MI6, but it's also about embracing wider parts of the financial sector, lawyers, accountants, estate agents, but also even social media platforms. Now, you know, well documented that the, the two terrorists who murdered Lee Rigby eight years ago had made, you know, obscene anti-inflammatory remarks on Facebook. So, you know, couple of years back you know facebook now allows you to do facebook messenger payments up to 30 pounds so who reports that facebook the bank the person receiving the money so you've got all of these little finite problems that i think could not be perfectly rectified but the exchange of information plays a big part i think in tackling financial crime thank you nick and I have one last question that it's a follow up from for what you said and something you said in the beginning, and then I think we can leave the floor to the public for questions. You said about lawyers and technology. So I'm mean, listening to Anna, how well she knows all that and you. Is the new generation of lawyers, I mean, is this well trained? I mean, and then because probably they will work in public enforcement and all that. So are we, I, I will put myself, are we really trained to all these new? You know technologies all these new standards something that is really far from the traditional law school that we all did very theoretical so i don't know what's your opinion for that uh, i think things are slowly changing um i can sp speak for my own personal experience in terms of the modules that i, I deliver and and a, and a big part of that is is on cyber crime and financial online crime and i've got to give a, a, a shout out to one of my colleagues henry hillman who, who delivers that course in, in bristol for us so we are getting there slowly. I think that in terms of, of law schools, there needs to be um, 
more synergy between the cyber security courses and I think the financial crime courses. Uh, you know, I'm not a technology expert. I can happily spout the facts and figures about money laundering and terrorism financing. But what we are seeing is that increased cooperation between cyber crime tech experts, academics and cyber security companies. And I think that's beginning to feed into now into how how law degrees and in particular how financial crime courses are delivered. But I think that that training then needs to be continued post degree, post professional qualifications, and also in terms of in house uh, CPD training, for example. So we we make sure that the uh, the next generation, you know, people who are a lot younger than I am, are going to be a lot more tech savvy. So they need to be continually trained to use technology. But what you can't then forget is that it's still very important to keep up to date with the current whistleblowing trends, money laundering trends, fraud trends, because, you know, financial criminals don't sit still. They will, so, you know, when when the pandemic is over, fingers crossed, and we do get a resemblance of normality, then we will see the normal activities in terms of financing and money laundering will, will, will be created again. So I think for me, yeah, it, it's a really important topic that we need to sort of address the cyber element, I think, with the, with the legal, normal, theoretical uh, teaching. Well, th thank you very much, really. Thank you very much. So I would like to ask Rico or the audience if there are any questions. I, mean, I don't know if there's anything on YouTube. So, or if you have any questions yourself, of course. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, we, we don't yet have any questions coming up on the live stream on YouTube. But I do have a quick question, which is, you know, so uh, technology is on the one hand becoming more user friendly, but on the other it's proliferation and complexity is, is also at the same time alienating and um, disempowering to the user. So particularly around uh, how everything uh, in terms of financial transactions is moving online and so forth. I was wondering um, if there's anything that members of the general public or, or you know, the layperson user of technology can do to help the development of policy or the improvement of regulatory measures Uh, thank you. Yeah, I don't know if Anna or Nick who wants to go first about that. I mean, I think to some extent, the uh, the extent to which a lay person can influence regulatory measures will depend also on the openness of regulatory bodies to, to actually listen, to actually listen uh, to the public. Um, I think that there have been some positives um, at least I can speak um, from work I've done in the past uh, involved with companies at the local government level that are really taking user design seriously. Um, on the legal tech level, there's a whole um, burgeoning um, sort of field of study even on legal design in legal tech. Um, a lot of that's being led out of out of Stanford University. So I think that, um, yeah, I mean, unfortunately, a lot of it will will come down to who's making the rules and you know the extent to which they'll 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 listen to the to the actual users but i think though i i hope uh, you know we've seen huge investments being being put into programs and pieces of technology that are then just not used because at an early stage in the process the time wasn't taken to actually listen to users and i think with you know that that feedback also you know reflects really badly um, and we have, um, again, you know, I've, I've experienced the, the kind of backlash um, when it comes to scrutiny of, for example, govern, you know, government spending um, on certain uh, pieces of technology that are then not used. So I think that the incentives are there. Um, the how is, uh, is the difficult part, but I, I hope that we'll be seeing that. I hope that we'll be seeing more of that. But I, I also understand, though, the, the burden on uh, you know, individual. You know, the the burden it can feel on individuals to feel like they have to. Um, you know, they have to be the ones to take the initiative. And I don't. I don't think um, we should be pushing it on to people um, to be raising these issues. I think you know they should be act. Their input should be actively sought out. Thank you. Yeah, Nick, if you want to. Yeah, I, I think that uh, end users are in a very difficult position because they they, they tend to be the the victim of uh, a fraud, a scam, uh, a phishing email. And I think it's, 
I think what um, end users can do is to provide, uh, and again, I, I think as Anna said, it depends really how receptive regulators are to, to public views. And I know that there's obviously consultation documents are published by government departments, but what you tend to find is that the, the replies will be from think tanks, academics, and maybe not necessarily members of the public. So I think really the, the important thing as we um, engage with more technology and we move away from traditional means of banking and finance to, to remote banking and, and online banking and, and uh, tablet and, and, and cell phone banking is that, you know, consumers have to be savvy, consumers have to be aware. And I think the onus on regulators is, is to make them aware of what the risks, I know we've seen this with, with the development of e-money and cryptocurrencies where, you know, people think they can make a, a very quick profit from investing their life savings into a new form of cryptocurrency. And of course, under UK regulations, that those are still not bound by a, a compensation scheme or deposit protection insurance scheme. So you do find that people will invest in new forms of e-money crypto and, and lose their life savings with no form of recompense at all. Um, so I think you know consumers have to be aware you know, financial literacy, which is a, a massive issue within the UK, is, is, you know, research upon that in the last four decades, it, you know, it, it claims that between 10% and a quarter of the UK population are financially illiterate. So in relation to how maybe a credit or debit card works, then in terms of new technology investments and, and the, the overcomplication of stocks and shares, it, it does make it a, a, a perfect playground for for the the white collar bully to, to to manipulate individuals and to gain access to their personal data, to gain access to their finances, so it is a very difficult position for the end user. Um, and you know whether they, the end user sees himself as a as a financial policeman in terms of reporting incidents, I, I don't know. I know that lawyers and the banks will see them maybe begrudgingly as a financial policeman, but that's an obligation imposed upon them by law. So whether that would apply to the end user, I don't very much. So oh, thank you. So Yuriko, yeah, I leave the floor to you. Thank you. Oh, I, I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Our, our time's actually running up out of out, and um, it's time for us to close. So I would like to say thank you so much to Nick and Anna for joining us today, um, and thanks to Mitros for for organising this wonderful conversation. It would be great to see more of these, maybe a follow up uh, in due course. And I'm sorry, we, we don't have um, enough time left for more questions from the floor. But uh, there'll be room uh, on our Facebook uh, page, as well as on the YouTube live stream once once it's edited and up online to for people to comment and ask more questions that we can follow up on. Uh, so yeah, please um, do consider joining the Global Research Network if you're watching. I forgot to say that we are um, earlier, I forgot to say that we have run many different kinds of events, social as well as academic. And uh, we've got one coming up, which is on craft chocolate tasting. You can go online. It's run by a professional um, craft chocolate taster who, uh, and the company can send you out a box and we'll do a sort of live history of craft chocolate uh, history of chocolate making and um uh, training session workshop around that we have coffee house meetings monthly research discussion groups where we can help people with their writing and grant applications and so on uh, so this really is um a very inclusive and, uh, and welcoming space so please come along uh, or join your students uh, invite your students to join us and we hope to see you soon okay so thank you very much anna thank and Nick. you and thank thanks you for having me for joining That's us. Great. Yeah, thanks everybody. Really great thank discussion. You. Thank you. Yeah, and we're looking forward to read more things from you. Maybe. <laughs> thank you. Thanks everybody.